So we, you have heard about the intricacies of diet in the management of obesity and the intricacies of exercise. When both of these fail, and they do fail over a period of time, there comes the role of pharmacotherapy. So I'll be briefly talking about what do we have now and what is there in the future about the pharmacotherapies. Now this is a very simplistic view of obesity when the energy in is more than energy out. If it was this simple, then uh, this would not be a big problem. However, obesity is a multifactorial disease and several uh, factors, neurobehavioral, endocrine, environmental, uh, immune, are several factors here are at play and uh, which make this a very complex and a chronic process, not easy to manage with single or one or two modalities. Why do we need to manage this? We all know that it, uh, managing obesity reduces the risk of s several metabolic problems, the risk of diabetes, and possibly the risk of cardiovascular disease. I don't need to uh, tell about this further. Why pharmacotherapy? Now, we all know that it's a chronic problem, and over a period of time, diet and lifestyle, they fail over a period of time, and even if they achieve results, it becomes difficult to maintain those results over a long period of time. So maintaining the weight loss or maintaining the gains what one has achieved with exercise, diet and exercise uh, uh, strategy over a period of time with uh, having uh, further weight loss. And once the body starts to lose, the, the metabolic adaptations and the body's own system starts to activate and that limits the weight loss. We all know that. Now we have to overcome that barrier and that is where the pharmacotherapy comes. Now these are the treatment options as for the BMI which uh, they recommended and uh, the international, according to the international cutoffs, Pharmacotherapy is advised if there's BMI more than 30 in the presence of complications or even more than 27 with complications and more than 35 without complications. However, in the Indian population, it is recommended that the pharmacotherapy may be started at a lower BMI as compared to Western population since we tend to develop more problems at an earlier stage. Now, before going on to discussion about any pharmacotherapy, this is a very important diagram. This here shows the central regulation of appetite. Here we see that there are several factors which are being produced by the liver, the intestine, as well as the adipose tissue, which lead to stimulation or activation of various centers in the brain through the uh, vagal afferents or through the circulation. And that is what it lead, that is what leads to several changes in the form of changes in the appetite, changes in the uh, patient's uh, uh, cra uh, craving for different kinds of food. So, so these are the factors and most of the pharmacotherapies are playing around or helping to activate some of these factors. Now this is the timeline of development of pharmacotherapy and way back from 1959 when phentermine was first started, there are several other drugs which have come and few of them have come and gone as well. The ones in the red, they came and they have gone. They were withdrawn from the market, though they were, some of them are quite good, especially cebutramine and locacerin, but now they're no longer available. What we have, have now is, in India we have is Orlistat, and we have is Liraglutide, but not the uh, Liraglutide 3 milligrams, which is actually recommended for uh, obesity. We have the other uh, Liraglutide, which is recommended for diabetes. And the next one is semaglutide, the oral form of which has been launched in India, but that is indicated only in diabetes. But it has also in, been approved in 2021 for management of obesity. So we'll discuss very briefly about all these. So basically drugs act on, by two mechanisms. One, they decrease appetite or the nutrient intake by acting on the central nervous system. Second is they act on the GI, they inhibit absorption of the nutrients. Now this here shows the efficacy of uh, weight loss interventions as we see that the various lifestyle interventions lead to weight loss maximum maybe up to 10%, not more. Whereas the bariatric surgery that leads to weight loss maybe 30% or more than 30%. So there is a gap between the 
weight loss that is achieved just by lifestyle alone and that which can be achieved by the bariatric surgery and possibly these new medications could fill that gap. So these are the pharmacological options which we have, which, we, which are available, as I said, Orlistat and Liraglutide are the only ones which are available in India as of now for approved for the management uh, of obesity. Liraglutide is not, but Orlistat is the only drug I would say effectively. Now the, this here briefly shows the various modes of action and the adverse effects. I'm sure this you can find uh, from the literature. Now this uh, diagram here shows the effects of GLP-1, GIP and glucagon. Because most of the drugs which are coming ha are playing around these uh, peptides or these hormones. Because GLP-1, the newer drugs, all of them, most of them are, uh, I, I think all of them are based on GLP-1. They are activating GLP-1, they may be activating GIP, they may be activating glucagon. So they are playing around the effects of these key, uh, let's say, hormones. So GLP-1-based therapies which are uh, there, which we have, uh, are the semaglutide and there are several others which are in the various phases of development. Liraglutide 3 milligram, just briefly saying the, uh, uh, mentioning here that it, uh, it has been shown to lead to up to almost 8% weight loss as compared to placebo. Semaglutide is the new kid on the block and is much, much talked about. This is a uh, GLP-1 analog and has a 90% uh, homology. It acts mainly on the hypothalamus by direct, direct, direct activation of uh, hypothalamus as well as the direct activation of the hindbrain. That is the area postrema and the nucleus of tractus solitarius. So these are the areas which are involved in the appetite uh, regulation. Now this leads to decrease in the appetite, decrease in the cravings as well as uh, it leads to a decrease in the energy intake and weight loss plus it also has host of other, other metabolic benefits. Now these are the various trials, briefly summarizing, the step trials of using uh, semaglutide where it has been uh, shown that uh, it led to almost 16 to 18% weight as, uh, as compared to placebo, which is a quite significant weight loss. Beyond weight loss, there was also seen re uh, reduction in the waist circumference, abdominal fat area, as well as a total abdomen, total body fat. Also, there was improvement in the other metabolic parameters, including blood pressure and the lipid uh, parameters. So it goes beyond weight loss. Acceptability profile, it was the main adverse effect as with GLP-1 agonists because they all stimulate the area postrema. And that is where the, GL, the, the receptors for this are there and that is the stimulation of which triggers nausea. So that is the one uh, major side effect which is common to all GLP-1 agonists. And uh, this all, uh, was also the same with this, but over a period of time it subsided. So accept acceptability was pretty good. Now coming to the potential actions of both GLP-1 and GIP, what, what if we combine both of them? GLP-1 has been the target, but now GIP-1, GIP also is the, uh, thought to be the target. Initially, why GIP was not developed uh, for treatment was that one in patients with diabetes the overall response to GIP was uh, blunted that is why even if you give more amount of GIP no benefit was uh, occurring and the other concern was that it could be potentially obesogenic now if you are trying to give for treatment and it causes weight gain that's counterproductive but now the premise is that the hypothesis is that when you give both of the, these together both of these together are, is likely to act on the brain and decrease the appetite. However, the whatever potential obesogenic uh, uh, effect of GIP may be counteracted by the effects of GLP. So beneficial effects will be augmented, the harmful effects will be counteracted. So that is the, on base of this presumption, dual agonists have been designed and tirzipatide is the one agonist which is now, we have seen a recent study uh, which has come out and uh, which the surmount trials and uh, which has shown almost 21% weight loss in, individu in individuals with tirzipatide. So this is something remarkable acting on both uh, these receptors. 
Now, this is another uh, medication, which is uh, cagrilantide and semaglutide. So, cagrilantide is the analog of amylin and semaglutide, as we talked about. So, combining these two together also leads to augmentation of the, the effects on the brain. So, semaglutide, as I mentioned earlier, acts on the hypothalamus and the uh, uh, brain stem, and cagrilantide also acts on the same. So, cagrisema is one combination which is undergoing uh, trials and has shown potential to provide additional weight loss without compromising the tolerability. Now coming to the <clears throat> combination of GLP-1 and glucagon agonist. Now the main uh, concern out here would be, somebody would say that why you are giving a glucagon receptor agonist? Because uh, GLP-1 acts on the... Uh, uh, effects which, de which decrease the effects of glucagon. Glucagon increases your uh, blood glucose, increases gluconeogenesis. So why would you like to stimulate that? But glucagon uh, increase in the glucagon effect also leads to increase in the energy expenditure. It leads to decrease in appetite. So again the premise here is that increased insulin, uh, a decrease in the appetite and increased ex energy expenditure, both uh, will uh, th these effects will be augmented and whatever increase in the glucose will be there by, by stimulation of glucagon that potentially may be counteracted by glucose induced insulin secretion by GLP-1. So the harmful effects will be neutralized, the benefic beneficial effects will be augmented. So this combination is also undergoing several trials. Animal trials have uh, been done and it has been shown that they lead to somewhere around 20 to 30 percent of weight loss and human trials are beginning, so let's hope we get this. Now, what if we stimulate all the three receptors together, GLP-1, GIP, and glucagon? So this is a step going ahead that we are seeing benefits with the GLP-1, we are seeing, seeing potential benefits with uh, stimulation of two receptors, why not make a molecule which uh, stimulates all the three? I mean, that is also being done, and uh, these uh, medications, some of them are under trial, and in animal studies, again, they have shown beneficial effects uh, with the weight loss ranging from about 20 to 30 percent over a short period. In the, in the rodents, they have uh, shown about 30 percent weight loss over a period of the 30 days, uh, which is remarkable. If they can lead to this much weight loss, then that is really good. Now, other medications which do sometimes cause weight loss but are not actually indicated for weight loss, Metformin, our good old metformin, it uh, may lead to weight loss, particularly in individuals where the weight gain is because of antipsychotic uh, medication uh, induced. SGLT2, very frequently uh, used, they have a host of uh, other uh, cardiovascular benefits, they also lead to significant weight loss. So in individuals in, uh, with diabetes, when there is no contraindication, these are the medications which may additionally help in weight loss. Now, some medications of the future are the Belorinib. These are just for completion's sake. I have added because they are undergoing different stages of uh, investigation. And th uh, this drug is an uh, analog of imagelin and selective methionine aminopeptidase inhibitor. Decreases fat biosynthesis, increases fat oxidation <clears throat> and lipolysis. And another one, bupropion zonisamide, which is... Uh, similar to uh, the other combination which we have, this is also undergoing the treatment, uh, undergoing the investigation. So, tizofensin, cetylistate actually is not a drug of the future. It's now available. It is being used maybe more, uh, as good or better than Orlistat without, with the better side effect profile. Fibroblast growth factor, this uh, is expressed primarily in liver mainly, but sometimes it may be expressed in the pancreas and skeletal muscle as well. It, it acts as a metabolic regulator. So drugs which are acting through this may be helpful in uh, having a better uh, control in the weight. Now these are the several uh, uh, strategies, I would say, which are being targeted, like stimulating uh, glucagon uh, receptor, uh, glucagon analogs, leptin sensitizers, or, or giving synthetic leptin drugs which are targeting the ghrelin pathway because we know ghrelin is one important uh, hormone which uh, has a role in obesity. And now the, there is a talk about vaccine for obesity because there are some uh, 
uh, lo long time back there was a research from Pennington Biomedical Center that uh, adenovirus is an important uh, cause which might be leading to increase in the BMI. So if some uh, organism is involved or we can make, an vac make a vaccine against just some uh, hormone or some peptide which, is, which has an important role. So the vaccine is, the, the targeted vaccines against ghrelin, they are being investigated. So you have a vaccine against ghrelin, possibly you have decrease in the appetite and that will lead to uh, better control in your, uh, better uh, management of your weight. So several of these are being uh, investigated strategies. Now there are some factors which will determine how much, your, uh, the, how much the drug is going to be effective. So whatever drug you are giving, the weight loss in the first three to six months is likely to predict how long, uh, how much weight loss will be there over a longer duration of time. And that has been shown in several studies. Now, the some factors are there if the patient has, say, intense food cravings and or depression. So then centrally acting drugs like naltrexone, pipipion may be a better option. And uh, in patients with diabetes or pre-diabetes, or as such in obesity, we, have, we may have liraglutide or the GLP-1 agonists. And if obese individuals who have high fat intake, the early stat or settle stat may be a better option, which may give a better results than the others. So in summary, obesity we know is a heterogeneous condition with various uh, neurobehavioral and endocrine factors which regulate the food intake. Lifestyle management remains the cornerstone, but it may fail over a period of time. Now the pharmacotherapies which combine the uh, weight loss efficacy, the long-term safety, that was safety is most important. Many of the drugs who were initially launched, launched, who were later withdrawn, had a wonderful effect in the beginning, but over a period of time, over a few years, we came to know about their potential adverse effects by decreasing complications. So as of now, the GLP-1 receptor agonists have shown the robust clinical evidence which fulfill all of these criteria as anti-obesity medications. Let's hope newer medications we see in the future which are targeting different uh, strategies and uh, the more we understand the physiology of obesity and the more we are likely to develop the uh, further drugs. With that, I would end my presentation. Thank you very much.